What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to help you to make workshops work by finding the magic ingredients. Today with me on the show is Tim Ferguson. He's a speaker, trainer, facilitator, and the CD CEO of Audience, an international agency for meeting and internal communication solutions. And we speak about the difference between outcomes and outputs through workshop and the different means of how to achieve them and why we should care. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you visit workshops.work and download mine? So stay tuned. Tim, welcome on the show. Oh, thanks so much, Miriam. I'm very excited to talk to you today and to learn from you. Well, likewise, I've been listening to your program for months since Leanne Hughes introduced me to you, uh, hearing you interviewed by Leanne. And um, every single time I listen, I learn from the guest and then from yourself, very much so. So I just feel very honored to be here. Thank you for such kind words to start with. I'm almost speechless. Um, so let me throw a question at you very quickly. <laughs> to get over this, um, you are a speaker and an author and a coach and a facilitator. And your company is called Audience. So you have more the perspective of or the approach to teach corporates to speak in public. So when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? Well, there's a lot to talk about there. So my company is called Audience. And we are definitely in the speaker training business. But first and foremost, we're an event design agency. So we create events for our corporate clients. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a two or three day event. Maybe there's two or 300 people there. And we help to conceptualize the event. What is the theme? What's the key message or concept? What's the agenda? And then help develop all of the content, plenary sessions, workshops and business simulations and that relationship between plenary workshop and business simulation i'm hoping we might talk about later in the show part of helping the clients be successful in such an event is speaker training so that the leadership usually at the beginning of the meeting stands on the stage and delivers an authentic clear concise message that they want their audience to really engage with and that's why we're called audience and we believe that the and this would translate into workshop facilitation we believe that nearly everything you need for preparation is not in you or your content it's in the audience so who mm -hmm. am i speaking to what's their reality what keeps them up at night what do they care about so i do speaker training and i've discovered the world of facilitation through providing this larger event service to our clients. And the way how you explained these events and the different parts of the event, it almost sounds like a big workshop. So you need where the moderator maybe is the facilitator who guides the audience with the different steps and where you have a very specific goal in mind, which will be either an outcome or an output. And hopefully you will help me to understand this <laughs> later in the show. Yeah, that's perfectly said. It is a journey. There's this, you know, we'd refer to it as the red thread. Well, actually, actually, it's funny. Depending on where people come from in the world, they either call it the golden thread, the silver thread, or the red thread. But it always means the same thing. It's the, it's the <laughs> storyline that runs through the event. Mm. And so what we try to think about is, okay, let's say, how are people going to feel the morning of day one? What do we want them to have made a transformation by the afternoon of day one? When they go off to dinner at the end of day one, what do we want them thinking and feeling? Morning of day two, where should people be at? What's the So by the end of day three and everyone's heading for home, we've achieved both outcomes and outputs. And we refer to outcome as the feeling, the emotion. So let's say an outcome would be building trust or mm -hmm. know each other on a deeper level or have thoroughly explored possibilities. These would be outcomes. Outputs would be we developed a plan or we 
created a solution or we learned a specific technique. You're always seeking both outcomes and outputs. And depending on the nature of the event, they may be more weighted towards one or the other. So outputs are more tangible things that you can maybe measure and put on paper, whereas outcomes are more intangible, maybe more subjective? Correct. Perfectly Thanks. said. I have to mention that I've been listening to your recent episodes. And for those who would love a master class on each of these topics, the deep mm -hmm. listening episode with Oscar Trimbley would be the outcomes like I felt like I was learning from a true master. Mm. And then from Sean uh, McGuire, talking about design thinking, a very outputs focused approach where you want to come to a specific solution by the end of the day, almost guaranteed. And they would just be a beautiful way of thinking about the relationship between, if you listen to those two episodes, you've got a great balance between outcomes and outputs. Yeah, and without going too much into detail and talking about other episodes while having you on the screen, what I also found interesting is this clear opposition between Oscar, who almost doesn't plan anything after lunch because he thinks, okay, it's the room and the audience that will guide him and tell him what they need, whereas Sean, who puts everything on the billboard. So yes. where he says everything is laid out in the beginning. So there's no opportunity to really shift the course of the workshop. Yes. And there uh, maybe, maybe have a topic that we cover. We do a lot of work in communication skills, presentation skills. And for facilitators out there who are trying to balance these two, when do I stick to the plan? When do I go with where the room needs to go? I think it might be a good illustration of how the art and science of this. So, Let's say you're doing a presentation skills workshop and the last third of the day is going to be everyone rehearsing with a partner and then each person presenting to the full room. Mm -hmm. Say it's a workshop of 12 or 14 people. And so you know as the facilitator going in, I need everyone by around 1.30 or 2 to feel relaxed enough and to have learned enough new skills that they can stand up and be very vulnerable. They can stand up and rehearse, and, and then eventually even present to the full room, which takes a lot of courage for most people. So I know that that's where I want to land. But let's say I open up the session and I realize that in my group, I have two or three raging extroverts who would like to get on the stage right away, and they're very comfortable mm. doing it. And then at the opposite end of the distribution curve, I have two or three people who are unbelievably terrified of this whole experience. And let's say I also layer in there that I realize that this group of people doesn't know each other at all. They work for the same company, but they don't know each other at all. Okay. Versus, let's say, another group. Let's say it's a leadership team. Very often, a senior leader will want his or her entire leadership team to come together and enhance their communication skills. And they come in and they're ready to go. They'd like to start to practice right away, perhaps. How do I balance my output versus outcome Mm. You know, because to, to break the ice, to get the room comfortable, maybe that takes 30 seconds, maybe that takes four hours. How do you judge what elements of your agenda to drop and what elements mm -hmm. to keep is, uh, I think you learn mostly just through practice, really. And there's one question that prompts my mind, which is the difference between a trainer and a facilitator. Mm -hmm. Because you're mentioning a workshop in facilitation training. Yes. And still you refer to the facilitator. So according to you, what would be the difference between the two and specifically the difference in mindset or maybe skill set to really help the room to get from A to B? Yeah, it's a great question. So first, maybe just put a few things on the table around nomenclature in the corporate world. So one of the challenges that we face is that for most corporate events, workshops are used in a very generic way. They mean small groups of people working in a breakout room. Sometimes they're called breakouts. So in some corporate clients, they call them breakouts and others, they call them workshops. Mm -hmm. And all they mean is it's small groups, uh, highly interactive. So it does get a little bit confusing, I suppose. Workshops, classically though, we would say a workshop is something that everyone must contribute to the ideas or the solution or the outcome. So if we are workshopping, 
let's say it's a selling skills workshop, it means everyone in the room is advancing the knowledge of everyone else in the room. The facilitator's mm -hmm. job is to kind of honor the abilities in the room, engage everyone's most thoughtful, creative self, and have them develop something together that none of them could have created mm -hmm. on their own. A training says, no, 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 no. There is actually a proper way to chop onions. There's actually, there is a proper way to uh, deliver a presentation. There's a, you know, so I've got knowledge as the facilitator and I'm going to ensure that you go through a series of steps in order to learn what I've come to teach. And a communication skills workshop in a corporate client is actually a fascinating combination of those two things because you're always dealing with the real content of the client's world, and then you're trying to impart upon them new skills that they don't currently have. And you have to yeah, balance those two properly. So would you rather refer to yourself as a trainer, a facilitator, or coach? I do all three. I do all three. And it's a good part of the briefing conversation with the client. So I'll say facilitator. The job of a facilitator is to get everyone speaking and engaged, introverts, extroverts, younger people, older people, subject matter expert, non-subject matter expert, doesn't matter who you put in the room. My job as a facilitator is to make sure that everyone participates and that we have the conversation that the client wanted us to have. Mm -hmm. So maybe I know nothing about what we're talking about. My job is to get everybody talking. If I'm there as a trainer, it's to say, okay, there's a specific skill, there's a specific area of competency that you want people working at. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make, like a personal trainer, I'm going to make sure we do the cardio and then we do the stretching and then mm -hmm. we do the. We close and then as the gap. a coach, I think of it very literalistically. I use coach to mean helping the team, the individual win. So if I'm going to be a leadership coach, it's like, hey, How do we elevate our leadership to accomplish our goals this year? Or if it's a communication skills coach, how are we going to elevate our communication skills so we accomplish the things that we're, we want to accomplish? And there's a sense of uh, bringing the group together to dig deep and kind of challenge themselves to elevate their ability. So, so those facilitators your coach are very output driven, yes. Mm. Although, although for, for a team to succeed, often you need a very strong trust, let's say. Amongst mm. them. So I would say that the outcomes drive output sometimes, if you will. I like that. So what hashtag would you give yourself with all these hats that you're wearing? I would hashtag create meaningful change. I don't know if it's a function of my age. I'm 51 years old this year. The maturity of our company, you know, we started in 1994. My amazing team, I've got an unbelievable team at Audience. And I think we feel we, a lot of corporate communication can just be flavor of the month. Uh, you know, it, it's not going to make an impact of any kind. You feel like you're just doing it because, well, someone said we should do it. And we feel like, nope, 2020 is going to be the year of create meaningful change. Life is too short. We want people who come to our events to feel amazing and learn new things. We want people to feel just simply listened to and respected and affirmed. You know, it's one of the great things about being a workshop facilitator is you have these moments where you see someone find their voice. You create a platform and an opportunity for someone to be vulnerable and open up and share something that they hadn't before. And that's an amazing moment. And that's creating meaningful change for that person. It could be as simple as that. Someone who very rarely ever speaks in meetings, speaks up in a meeting and, and feels great about it. I mean, that you go home at night feeling incredibly rewarded for that. Yet, mm. yet alone, if your workshop leads a group of people to an incredible breakthrough solution, the kind that Sean McGuire was talking about, you know, where they really crack a very difficult problem. I mean, that feels incredible. Maybe the most rewarding for me is working with leadership teams where there's a new senior leader who comes and brings his or her team together. Everyone is nervous. Everyone is thinking, oh, is this guy going to clean house? Am I going to be the one looking for a job in three mm -hmm. weeks? Am I going to fit in? And they arrive at the, at the offsite, guards up and very nervous. 
And then through the, through the experience, they realize that this new leader is a great person and the intention is to be a great team. And we come together and everyone leaves with a whole new lease on life. And this, I think the thing that knits it all together is this is creating meaningful change. Beautiful. Thank you. And I like your final example with the leadership team, which makes me circle back to the moment when you described what a workshop is. And I was thinking, okay, so what is actually the difference to a well-facilitated meeting where you also want everyone to contribute? Mm. So what would be the advantage, according to you, to have this new leader joining with a breakout or with a workshop as opposed to a meeting where everyone also can contribute? So I think that workshops are ideally suited for topics. So let's say we're going to come together as a leadership team and we have two responsibilities. We have an operating plan that needs to be revised and uh, streamlined. So we need to get that operating plan in place. And then we have very specific metrics we need to drive in terms of how much of our product we sell or how much market share we capture. So it's a kind of a, one internal and one external. That's going to keep us busy for a thousand years sort of thing. <laughs> to do this though, to do it effectively, we need to be great leaders for our people. And so the first two topics, you can have meetings about those and you will have a thousand meetings about those. A workshop would be to say, okay, what holds us together as a team? Like, what are our values? What do we stand for? How do we want to show up as leaders? What does it mean to be a leader? Mm -hmm. What do our employees need from us? What is our commitment to them? What's our commitment to each other? How do we feel about our customers? Do we know our customers? Do we respect our customers? What are we going to be known for? What's going to be our signature as a team? Are we going to keep our word? Are we going to be courageous speakers? These topics are, you know, you can't hire a consultant to come and give you those topics. Mm -hmm. You need to do the work yourself. Mm -hmm. So in that very simple question, what is the work that needs to be done, guides you towards whether this is a meeting or a workshop. So let's say the work that needs to be done is we need to quickly update each other on our projects. Okay, probably a meeting. If what needs to be done is we need to understand why our engagement scores are so low and find some solutions that each of us as leaders can take forward. That's a workshop. That's a workshop. Mm. So what would be your tools to drive a meaningful outcome and a meaningful output in a workshop or even in a meeting? Yeah. <laughs> so I think for all, questions are very important. So what questions is this meeting meant to address? So what is the deep, thought-provoking, urgent question that we're here to address? If people feel that they're there to speak about something sort of superficial or only semi-relevant or a big problem would be buzzwords, right? So let's say mm -hmm. agility. In the corporate world, the last few years, everyone wants to be agile, right? Yeah. And a lot of employees are very cynical about this. It's like, oh, it's just the new, okay, here's the new, it used to be synergy and then it was customer focus. And the, you know, before that it was whatever. Now the flavor of the month, okay, let's get this done. Uh, agility, all right, tell me what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> and then you're like, well, no, actually, this is really cool. Agility is more than just a buzzword and it means challenging some fundamental assumptions. So we want to challenge those assumptions and we want to create an agility plan for ourselves. So is that meeting, am I talking about outputs or outcomes? What is needed there? And I think it's probably a combination of both, right? So the outcome would be people reduce their cynicism around this word mm -hmm. and realize that agility is here to stay, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then the output would be a concrete three next steps that we're going to take as a team to be more agile. Mm. So the way you get beneath the surface and understand what's needed is through just a very good solid brief from your client and having multiple conversations where you take your initial briefing, you create an event design or a workshop design, you come back to the client with it, you talk through it in detail. You know, what are we doing at 9 a.m.? What are we doing at 10 a.m.? You like go through all the exercises, all the steps, 
and then back and forth reviewing it to be really sure, like, are these the questions you really want to be answering in this workshop? Yeah, a great example of not really knowing what the balance needs to be with outcomes versus outputs would be a workshop that is designed to set priorities for a team. So let's say there's a leadership team of 10 or 12 people. They currently oversee collectively 15 or 20 priorities, quote unquote. They realize this is absurd. They need to cut it down. I actually often say that um, about 100 years ago, there was no such thing as a plural for priority. There was just, there was no, it was just priority, right? The thing that comes before all other things. And industrial revolution type sort of thing leads, leads us to this ridiculous idea of multiple priorities. And everyone will agree, in principle, everyone's on board. Yes, we should have one or two or three priorities. The moment, though, that the things we're going to stop doing are associated with my daily work. So mm. if we're saying, okay, my team needs to reduce their budget, or I need to give up an initiative, or I need to give up you know, some of my responsibility. People don't like that. It's like, okay, can we prioritize something else? I want to hold <laughs> on to my part. So for us to logically agree what the two or three things are, if no one had any personal stake in it, if they were detached, and it's actually a, a very interesting exercise to do where you have people who are not associated with your priorities help you force rank them. It tends to be a pretty straightforward, easy exercise, right? Intellectually, it's, it's, it's obvious. It's only when the emotions get involved and the territorialism gets involved that otherwise very logical people become remarkably illogical. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to achieve, it's probably going to require very little left brain thinking to achieve the priority setting. It's going to take a lot of right brain exploration, emotion, intuition, how are people feeling? Um, I need to trust that if I give something up, you're not going to give me up, you know, that if mm. I, if we give up my initiative, mm. I get to Good keep point. my job, right? To detach and, it from identity issues and yeah, yeah, sense of belonging. So I have a few questions just to dig a little bit deeper in there, because one is that I hear that you really need to distinguish also what are the consequences of each priority. Because you don't want a priority to remain a buzzword because then everyone agrees, but nobody's really aware of the consequences for themselves and the organization and their team. And the other question would be, so how would you facilitate this process that a team of 12 really comes up with three priorities and agree what they actually mean? Yeah, you need to help people think them through to the desired outcome. So if we say, okay, so the process might be, what is it that our customers value? What is it that our organization needs? And what are the available resources at our disposal? So you're kind of setting the table, like trying to paint the picture of reality. We do often in a priority setting workshop, the morning would be about just establishing an agreed upon view of reality. And it's nice to work from the outside in. So what is the marketplace? What are our competitors doing? What do our customers want? Okay, great. Our organization, where are we at as a larger organization? What's our situation? Are we struggling? Are we doing well? Are we expanding? Are we retracting? Okay. Our senior leaders, how do they see the world right now? What are their priorities? So trying to get people to step away from their own business, get out of their own shoes, and see the world from as an objective point of view as possible. Mm, this helps then also to deal with emotions because you detach your own stakes from the That's situation. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Then we like to do a careful listening to each other. So, okay, so what now is for the people in this room, what are your priorities? So let's forget us working together. Let's just start with, you know, let's put it on the table. What are each of you working on and, Because it's amazing how in an organization, the left hand will not know what the right hand is doing. Mm -hmm. So then we put our reality on the table. So now we have sort of external reality, our reality on the table. Then we ask a question along the lines of, so for the most impact and the least effort, what types of priority should we focus on? So let's not look at what we're currently doing, but just, you know, if you could start from scratch or with a blank sheet of paper mm -hmm. and you had to articulate what type of activity should we be engaged in, let's paint that picture. 
Now we come to our existing priorities and we've got this almost like a filter system that we've created mm. to pass them through. And if th this is what I'm saying about, about the trust in the team. So let's say by this point, very, very high level of trust. Communication is flowing nicely. People feel really good about each other. The logic of passing our existing priorities through this filter that we've created, it happens almost like an, a hot knife and butter. It's so simple. It's so clear. It's only when, if you haven't gotten the teams feeling for each other at the right level, now people are, you know, they're being a little bit disingenuous. Mm -hmm. uh, they're defending things. They're putting logic in place that's not real logic. You know, they're just maneuvering. And you quickly realize, okay, we're, we're maybe not going to achieve our goals today. Thank you, Miriam. This is Andrew. I'm a facilitator and head of customer success at Session Lab, the dynamic workshop planner tool. We built Session Lab to help people design better workshops. We still remember the frustrating process of having to design workshop agendas in Excel or Word. And every time we made a change to the agenda, we would have to adjust the timing, copy and paste things back and forth. And it was hard to collaborate and ensure that we were all working on the latest version. This is why we built Session Lab, to give you a tool that allows you to focus on designing a solid group process. Check out Session Lab to save time and effort in your workshop design process and now get your first two months of Session Lab Pro absolutely free at sessionlab.com forward slash workshops work. So what does it take to create this trust in the first place? Because it sounds so beautiful and I can see the flow But then reality happens and maybe these 12 people see reality differently. Maybe they collect different information. Maybe yeah. they point out things that haven't been addressed before. So how do you make sure that this trust really develops? It's a great question. I mean, a lot of times clients will be like, okay, so we're going to do a one-day workshop and we want to come away fully trusting each other, be fully aligned on our strategic plan, have three key messages delivered to our employees at, you know, And it's like, okay, and we, we want to do this in six hours and uh, we're not going to do an offsite. We're going to do an onsite because we don't have the budget. <laughs> so, uh, so part of the answer is time. For me, the perfect leadership offsite is two days of content over three days. So a Tuesday afternoon to, to Thursday afternoon with two evenings and the evenings are really important. So that in that priority setting exercise I was talking about, we can do nearly all the intellectual work on the Thursday morning, all be done easy. Mm. If we've done the right work Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday and let the evenings work their magic, I have an opening exercise I do on the mornings of days two and three called what passed the bar exam. Mm -hmm. And the idea of the bar exam is, so you're at the offsite and you know, you've been talking buzzwords all day and there's post-it notes flying everywhere and the facilitator has been really great and everyone seems fired up, right? And then later on that night at the bar, you're with one of your colleagues who you've known for a long time, you're, you're genuinely friends, and one says to the other, so you were talking today, like you really think this agility thing is fantastic. Like, did you really mean that? I mean, isn't it just a bunch of BS? And in that moment is, this is the moment of truth. This is the bar exam. So if you turn and say, yeah, I think it's BS too. Okay, so my, our workshop just failed the bar exam. So everything we were talking about all day was just performative. Everyone was just trying to sound on board because they think that's what the boss wants. The other response is, no, actually, you know what? I know it sounds cheesy, but I think this agility thing is great. And I think Miriam's vision is fantastic. And I'm actually on board. So this is the bar exam. And so in the morning, I will frame it that way. And I'll just say, okay, Hey, everyone, uh, we've got half an hour now to, to kind of debrief yesterday. What passed the bar exam? And I frame it that way. And sometimes they stay in bullshit mode, pardon my French, and we don't really hear anything. But other times it's amazing. And, and someone will say this very honest thing, like maybe someone says, uh, yeah, I feel this is all going nowhere. I don't even know why we're here. I think it's a big waste of our time. And for me, that's like, okay, huge success. Boom. Yeah. Now we just got real. Or maybe the, the most cynical, most jaded person in the room is actually on board. 
And they say at that same moment, they say, you know, when I came in here, I thought this was going to be just another one of those blah, blahs. <laughs> and I think it's actually really amazing. And that's another one of those like magic moments. And so the trust is only going to come. I don't know if you've, if you've looked at Brene Brown's work or, or seen mm-hmm. her TED talk, but yeah. she's the genius of this, right? And she would say that the price of authenticity is vulnerability. And I would say that, yeah, in order to be vulnerable, you must have courage. Mm-hmm. And when you feel like your job is maybe on the line, this is no trivial thing. So to create trust, it's like you can't guarantee you're going to get there by a certain moment. And you're, you're never quite sure where it's going to come. And you need to create a number of opportunities throughout your workshop for, and I think, uh, again, Oscar Trimbley was brilliant at this. You need to create a number of opportunities for things to get real. And then once things do get real, you need to be ready to throw the entire agenda out the window, if need be, and go with the reality. And it almost sounds like a hen and egg problem where Mm. you need trust and a safe space in order to open up and to have the courage to speak the truth. But for this to happen, obviously, you need to trust first. So you will create trust by being vulnerable and open. But in order to do that, you also need the trusting environment. So does it always need to be the leader or the most senior person in the room to break this maybe vicious circle of distrust and dishonesty, bar talk? Often it's the the best thing is for the senior leader to be the last to speak Mm -hmm. and to give permission for people to speak. You'll see people's eyes dart at the leader. The world is still, unfortunately, unbelievably hierarchical. So let's say in, in my bar exam in the morning, as people are sitting down, I usually ask, the senior leader to speak last, always be the last to speak, Mm -hmm. listen, you know, and as people are opening up and sharing their thoughts, eyes are darting quickly, taking quick glances to see how the leader is reacting. And so the body language of that senior leader, the words they choose to say in those moments are like, you're on a, you're on a high wire, you know, You you can send the workshop one direction or the other. It also depends on the reputation of this person. Mm. So let's just say, I mean, I'll just say it, right? There are a lot of senior leaders who there is no leadership there at all. It's, they should not be called a leader. They should be called a senior authority. Authority <laughs> manager. You know? mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. They, 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 that it's pure old school, my way or the highway, tough person leadership. And you see this, unfortunately, across all sorts of industries around the world. If my job is to build trust in a team and the senior leader's heart is hardened, Mm -hmm. this may be impossible. And you may be setting, actually setting the people up for real trouble. So if I'm going to get a group to open up and be vulnerable, and yet the boss is just like a wolf in sheep's clothing, Mm -hmm. I hate this situation Mm -hmm. and um, try to avoid it. What I do is I clung on to any client I have that is, has a great heart, an open heart, who is a servant leader, who wants the best for their team, who really walks the talk. These are my clients. These are the people that I work with and follow. And so in that case, I know that when the team opens up mm-hmm. and shares their real thoughts, I know they're going to they're be safe. embraced by the leader. Mm-hmm. And now I can do it with them. Um, I can lead them in that direction myself feeling very wholehearted Mm -hmm. about it. But if I feel that maybe I'm leading them off a cliff because the senior leadership in their organization is not going to put up with people being open and speaking their minds and challenging the leadership's ideas and, you know, bringing the real questions to the table, I have to be careful. I don't, I don't want to put anyone in jeopardy, right? It's beautiful edge, new edge on the perspective of what a facilitator is and our responsibility to actually understand the leader and to see, okay, how far can I actually push the group to open up? Because if they, as you said, if they open up and then they fall off the cliff, it's partly the responsibility of the facilitator who should have known before. Yeah. You're the guest. 
Mm. You're, yes, you don't live there. I mean, I'm the agency person, right? It would be different yeah. if you're an internal facilitator within the company, but you must never forget that you're a guest. They need to live there the next day. Yeah. They need to stay, right? Yeah. So you're a one day awesome offsite that blows everybody's mind and everybody, well, okay, you're going to be gone having the next awesome offsite with another team the next day. These people need to work with what you've created yeah. or, or deal with the cans of worms you've opened. You must be very respectful of this. So would you then rather coach such a leader if you realize that the leader is maybe just a wolf in a sheepskin? Would you rather coach them or would you say, I don't see this happening and I guess you need to find another facilitator? Oh, it's, a, it's such a good question. I mean, I come from the very scrappy competitive agency world where our answer to all client requests is yes. <laughs> and so, and so it's hard. It's been very hard to balance these things, right? I would like to say that I'm more altruistic and turning down work whenever I don't feel it's spiritually aligned with, you know, all the great things of, of the world. So what I try to do is, yes, is to coach where I can and to help the client become more enlightened around leadership. Mm -hmm. I will challenge the client to say, What is the trust level currently? Why would it be where you think that it is? How well do you know your people? I do like to interview. I think it was Oscar. There was, there was someone, I think it was Oscar who said he doesn't like to interview people in advance. And his answer was so interesting. I do like to interview two or three of my participants in advance mm -hmm. and get their perspective. And sometimes I can come back to the leader with that and say, hey, I know you think that trust is at an 8.5 out of 10. Your team seems to think it's at a 3.2. Uh, why the discrepancy, you know, and work with them in advance. I often just, we talk about leaders or leadership books or leadership philosophies. And so that I understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Are there concepts that, that we hold in common? I will ask what the boundaries are for the workshop and, you know, where they'd like me to go. And then based on their answers. So let's just say I, we've been hired. It's part of a larger contract. It's a very big piece of business. We're going to do this one day workshop. I feel it's the wolf in sheep's clothing. You can easily create a workshop that's going to be fun and productive. And, you know, people are going to be happy at the end. They're going to, they're going to have had a great day, but they're not going to have had to have opened up and been so vulnerable and revealed so much about themselves. And I feel protective of, of my participants. I don't want, um, in presentation skills, and maybe this is because of my background as a presentation skills coach. Early in my career, I had a guy cry. We were doing where everyone is rehearsed, and now each person is going to go and present to the full room. Mm -hmm. And one individual, just before he, his time was, you know, it's like the going around the clock, right? He can see, okay, I'm third next, I'm second next, okay, mm -hmm. I'm next. And when it came to his turn, he burst out crying. He broke down. He was just so nervous and had to leave the room. And I felt horrible. And it was, I was, you know, I'd only been doing it for a couple of years. I had a lot of successes. I'd used a certain approach. It was always working. And I got too arrogant, I guess. As a facilitator, the moment you think you're a master facilitator, you're about to get smacked. You're about to learn that you, that you haven't learned at all. And, you know, I put this person in jeopardy. I put this person in a terrible position and I felt horrible about that. And so I've always since then had this sense of, you know, you're almost like the lifeguard a little bit, like you're the facilitator and you're also playing mm -hmm. lifeguard. You're, you're making sure that this doesn't go too far or get too hot or get too heated because these people have to work there the next day, you know? Yeah. And now I wonder, coming back to the outcome versus output, is it possible to achieve a sustainable output without having the outcomes that go along with it? I would say to have real meaningful impact, to create meaningful change, you do need those outcomes. You do mm. need that trust. I mean, in the military or in, or in sport or, you know, so many other walks of life, a, a surgery team, you know, air traffic controllers, like people for whom the consequence of failure is so categorical and clear, there tends to be this understanding that, hey, we need to put everything on the table. We need to... Even, we don't need to like each other, but we, knew, we do need to trust mm. in our roles and how we operate as a team. And the same is true for the corporate world. 
you can't live in the Dilbert version of the corporate world and achieve anything great. You need to move to that high performing team that puts it all on the table. There is no safe path to greatness. There is no safe path to, you know, success. It just doesn't. So if you want to muddle along hidden within an organization, no one really knowing it that you're there, but you get to keep your paycheck, then just go for outputs and keep it superficial. But if you want to achieve something fantastic in your career or as a team, and you want to be very proud of the year that you had, you need to go for those outcomes. Mm. So according to you, what is the perfect recipe to fail a workshop? Bring the wrong people for the wrong reasons to the wrong place at the wrong time. And I, I think I've had that, that perfect storm, you know, and any one of those is going to work against you. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just say timing. I've done run workshops where like, why isn't this working? No, you know, it seems like a great team. Seems like a great topic. Mm -hmm. like, it seems like, you know, the right concept for the workshop seems like the right facilitator. And I've had people come to me at the break and say, Oh, Tim, don't worry about it. I, I can, you know, you're, you're, it's budget planning time. I don't know why we're mm. having this workshop right now. Every single person in this room is working seven days a week. Uh, we've all been up all night or, you know, or I've had to do workshops right after a layoff announcement, for instance. Yeah. And, and I guess these are the moments where you realize how much value there is in talking to the participants beforehand. Because this kind of information you get out of the interviews. So you have a short phone call. You ask them, okay, what's on your mind? Are you ready for the workshop? And then they will tell you these stories. Exactly. Mm. That's right. These small insights that change everything. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. Before we close, there's one topic that is still on my mind that I would like to at least briefly touch. You are currently working on a book. Yes. Um, the Handbook for Corporate Presenters. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough and feel very proud that you sent me a sample chapter on facilitation. Yes. So according to you, why is it important to have a chapter on facilitation in a corporate presenter's handbook? Well, I think that presenting well gets all the limelight. You know, people see the TED Talks and they, they hear about famous speeches through history and there's a lot of kudos associated with presenting well. And it is a very powerful and important tool, but it tends to only be required in certain circumstances. Usually the presenter is some form of expert. They have content or knowledge that the audience does not. They create a well-prepared linear story with a beginning, middle, and an end, and they deliver it super effectively. Okay, great. And this book will help you do that. However, this is not TED Talk. This is Tuesday morning. You've got a meeting to run. You've got six of your colleagues who come into the room. They all open up their laptops. None of them want to be in the room. You want to make it a great experience. And if you can do that, you've got a superpower that is very rare. And if you extend that to being able to run full day offsite meetings for your team, It's just a very powerful tool and it's very useful in peer to peer situations where mm -hmm. I'm not the expert. We're all on the same level, but we need to have a productive conversation together. And there's egos in the room and, and competing agendas in the room. And I need to somehow get past all of that so that we can focus on the task at hand. And this is what facilitators are so good at. So I wanted to have a chapter on, on this topic because I just feel it's, uh, it's the ultimate underappreciated soft skill in the corporate world, I think. Mm, thank and you. that's why your podcast and the podcast of Leanne Hughes are so unbelievable, uh, just these gifts to the world. And I wish everyone could listen to them because if you are working in the corporate setting, your combined content gives people everything they need to know to really improve in this area. And I think for every great presentation that you'll give, you'll have, you know, a hundred opportunities to run a meeting mm. and you should, get better at that. Thank you. I don't want to say anything else after such nice words. <laughs> <laughs> And obviously, I totally agree. I think the, the future managers are facilitators, or at least that's my wish to the world. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and just to just say a word about that. So there's so much talk about millennials and engaging millennials. Mm. And the shortest route to doing so is to be a facilitator leader let them speak, 
give people a chance to share their ideas, uh, let, you know, let, get the different perspectives on the table. So less making statements, more asking questions. Less time preparing PowerPoints, more time preparing room setup. Mm. Uh, a little bit more attention to the unexpected comments that are going to be made by your audience versus trying to drive home a message. And that switch from presenter leader to facilitator leader, if you want to be successful with that millennial generation, it's, it's as simple as switch as that. Awesome. If any of the listeners fell asleep after minute one and just woke up and doesn't have time to listen to <laughs> the hour, mm -hmm. what would you like them to take away? Well, I'd like them to take away, if they're listening to this, facilitation is interesting to them. And I just would say, you know, you're part of a very special group around the world who are helpers and you are working in a very human area and a very humane area and that you can create meaningful change as a facilitator for that. Sometimes you'll have an impact that will last for many, many years. And you've joined a great enterprise and I just uh, congratulate everyone on their desire to get better at it by listening to your, your podcast. Thank you. And if someone wants to reach out to you, get into a conversation, learn from you, work for you, with you, or have you facilitate their leadership offsite, how can they get in touch? Well, they can email me at tim.ferguson at audienceinc.ca, or they can find me on LinkedIn, Tim Ferguson, or you can find my company audience on LinkedIn, and you can go to our website www.audienceinc.ca and uh, through any of those mechanisms you can get through to me or my team and I should say I've got you know 30 of us around the world and wow. four different countries so there's lots of members of the audience family that you could engage with in, in addition to myself awesome and I will put all of that in the show notes thank you Tim for sharing your experience your knowledge your wisdom and for sharing your time Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.org to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.